New World Witchery is a Patreon-supported podcast. This episode is supported by listener Fernwa Patronus, upon whom we are bestowing the title of Witchy Scrabble Champion. We hope you get all the points and all the magic. If you'd like to become a patron and help support the show while also getting some great perks, please visit www.patreon.com slash newworldwitchery where you can pledge a dollar a month or whatever you can to help us buy enough letter tiles to keep Frenois' magic flowing. And thanks to all of our listeners. Are you looking for magic? Maybe magic that lives right where you do? If so, join us aboard our broomsticks and ride with us from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Yukon to the Yucatan, and find magic that's right outside your front door or just off of Route 66. Whether you're in the Windy City or the Crescent City, the city that never sleeps or the city of brotherly love, we've got enchantment for you. I'm Corey. And I'm Lane. And this is New World Witchery. This time around, we're looking straight into the evil eye with our guest, Antonio Pagliarulo. In the preface to his edited scholastic volume, The Evil Eye, a casebook, folklorist Alan Dundas states, The evil eye is a widespread, but by no means universal, folk belief complex, according to which the gaze or praise of one individual at or for another may cause illness or even death to the second individual or to an object belonging to that individual. This idea that a malign glance can do grievous harm to a person and property is of great antiquity. It is mentioned in the Bible, as well as in Sumerian and other ancient Near Eastern texts, which would make it more than 5,000 years old, at the very least. Widely reported from India to Ireland, the evil eye seems to be common among Indo-European and Semitic cultures past and present. Immigrants to the New World from circum-Mediterranean countries, e.g. Italians, Greeks, Arabs, and Spanish people, brought their evil eye belief system with them, and to this day, some of their descendants continue to fear the consequences of exposure to someone with the evil eye. He goes on to state that the reader should keep in mind that the evil eye is not some old-fashioned superstitious belief of interest solely to antiquarians. The evil eye continues to be a powerful factor affecting the behavior of countless millions of people throughout the Indo-European and Semitic world. Certainly in India, in the Arab world, and among the circum-Mediterranean peoples and their descendants in North and South America, one will find without difficulty innumerable illustrations of that remarkably pervasive and persistent influence of the evil eye belief complex. He goes on to tell a story about how a woman once came up to him after a lecture and told him all about her in-laws from, at that time, what was known as Yugoslavia, giving her specific instructions about how to care and dress for her children in order to avoid them being contaminated by the evils of the evil eye. Dundas makes the case that this is a modern, contemporary practice as well as one dating back thousands of years. The phrase, the evil eye, is one that pops up a lot when discussing folk magic. It's one of the few types of folk magic that can be openly discussed in a lot of circumstances because most people have heard of it, and many have even heard remedies for it from their communities. Blue and white beads, decorative hangings of hands, little amulets of horns or fists, oil poured into water. There are probably as many remedies for the eye as there are for another nearly as commonplace malady, hiccups. Everyone has a method they know, perhaps even one they insist is the only one that will actually work, although I've found many people are eager to exchange methods more than denounce someone else's. One of the most baffling elements of the eye is that it sometimes is cast on accident, and sometimes on purpose, but always the focus is on breaking its influence and not just assigning blame. With it being so widespread, and just about anyone being capable of giving or receiving the eye at any time, it may be one of the most pervasive bits of folk cursing around. Our guest tonight has literally written the book on the topic of the evil eye. In our chat, Antonio Pagliarulo explores the history, uses of, and deflection of the eye. 
He looks at the way the eye has appeared in many cultures and explains why he thinks it's important as a form of magic for anyone who acts as a practicing sorcerer to understand. Our guest this time around on New World Witchery is Antonio Pagliarulo. He's the author of The Evil Eye, The History, Mystery, and Magic of the Quiet Curse, a new book coming out from Wiser Publications here in 2023. Antonio, we are thrilled to have you on to talk about this very old and yet still contemporary form of folk magic. So welcome to New World Witchery. Thank you, Corey. It's a great pleasure to be here. Great fan of your work. Well, thank you. We're delighted to have you here with us. Let's let's take you all the way back to your childhood. Let's let's start there because I, I know you grew up in New York in the Bronx, and in the book you yeah. talk about like the friends that you had and kind of the different traditions that you were exposed to. I'm kind of curious as a child when you were looking around, were you aware of kind of all the the little magical things around you? So, so in growing up. In first of all, the the home I grew up in is and and you're going to hear in the background. I live in Manhattan, so you're going to hear all of that mm-hmm. <laughs> in the backgrounds, the sirens, and so pardon that. But so growing up in the house I grew up in in the Bronx, I'm you know the child of immigrants. My parents and my siblings and I lived upstairs. My grandparents, my mother's parents, lived downstairs. They only spoke Italian, and they, as I write about it in the book, you know, my grandmother was, you know, known very much in certainly in the neighborhood and also in the town from which she came for diagnosing and and curing, you know, the evil eye and and going downstairs was always the bowl, the water, the oil. And my grandfather always, you know, taught us, my siblings and I, things about hand gestures and how to ward the eye, how to do this hand gesture, how to do that. There was magic in hand gestures. And Although they were both very devout Catholics, they would never have considered themselves, you know, witches, as as today we talk about a folk witch, folk practitioner, things like that. They they considered themselves Catholic, but they practiced folk magic. And my grandfather, you know, made wine in the basement of our home. And he had, you know, a thriving garden in, in the back. And also he had a, a garden in upstate New York and he grew all these outrageous vegetables, but he would plant every he did everything, everything by the phases of the moon. Mm-hmm. And right back to when, you know, my mom likes to tell the story that I was quite a few days late, you know, being born into the world. And she was, you know, there, you know, very big with 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 pregnancy because I was a big baby. And my grandfather told her, you got a few more days because the moon has to reach a certain kind of place before he's going to be born, because that's when, you know, according to his belief and what he had been raised with. That was the time, you know, when a baby was going to come. And then my mother said, that's what happened. And I was born pretty much when when he said I'd be born. So I grew up with that magic in the house. And then my neighborhood was very much Italian Catholic, but also lots of, from lots of influence, you know, the Latino community, South American community, Caribbean community, so much diversity really and i still go back to my old neighborhood all the time you know jennifer lopez was the only one on the six i took uh-huh. the six train my whole life <laughs> and, yeah. you know, she was castle hill i'm zariga i'm zariga avenue for anyone in the bronx who might be listening they know what i'm talking about or anyone on the six in in the city knows that and i saw so many different aspects of what i now know is folk magic because we had neighbors who were not italian but who you know, did their own sorts of rituals. And most of them were very much rooted in in Catholicism or in some form of of what we would today call sort of folk Catholicism or some aspect of Christianity that sort of blended with a different tradition. There were, you know, people who, who would tie ribbons on their fences mm-hmm. or you know, um, down the block there was a woman who you know, we never understood why she would leave, you know, eggs out in front of her house on Mm -hmm. certain days. And later on, you know, as a, you know, a 19 year old kid, you know, 
I, I asked her and, and it was, you know, to, to take away the negative energy, something bad had happened and this was how she fixed it. And um, so I grew up in this kind of neighborhood and it's not very, it's not very rare. I mean, it, growing up in New York, you really get that, you know, it's one of the things that you, that you have. That's, that's one of the things that I always think back on. Even here, I live in my, you know, I spent most of my adult life, you know, living in Manhattan and there's so much going on mm-hmm. and there's so much to see from every different you know. but growing up that was certainly you know everywhere around me it was not only in my home it was just everywhere around me and and i always feel very very fortunate to have to have been raised there yeah i mean that that kind of inter- intercultural intersectionality and, and sort of cross cultural exchange that you've got going on in a space like that where people do see what each other are doing and you know every once in a while somebody's like hmm what they're doing seems to be working a little better than what i'm doing let me try that out or or you know even sharing recipes or ideas just learning about each other's work i think is so moving and so powerful so yeah i, I can totally see what you mean by that and it's wonderful i think new york and a lot of other cities but new york especially is one of those places where there there really is such a wonderful mix of people I mean, you could probably do an entire book on each neighborhood of New York and never run out of folk magic yeah. material. So, yeah. True. So, I mean, you mentioned the eye, which obviously is the, the book that you've written too, the evil eye, Malocchio goes, goes by a ton of other names as well, but it's interesting because it seems like it could be, it, it seems like it's something different to different people, not, not hugely different, but there are just these interesting variations that we see sort of in what is the eye and what does the eye do? So I'm curious, can you, Give us kind of your operating definition of what the eye is and what the eye does. Yes. So the evil eye is, it is a curse or a negative, you know, force, a negative punch of energy that unfurls in in your life. And it is cast through a glance. Now, underneath that glance is really what we're, we're talking about it is born from envy, from jealousy, from resentment, from anger, from all of these emotions. And oftentimes, people don't realize that they're doing it. You know, not everyone wants to recognize their own envy and their own jealousy. So this is where sometimes the evil eye is intentional. It is also unintentional sometimes. And that's where you have the old practice growing up. A lot of people in in my community growing up, especially in Italian American, if someone gave you a compliment, it was always followed by, you know, God bless you or something, because that that was meant to, you know, deflect the eye. Or some people would spit two or three times, that was meant to deflect the eye. So it's either intentional, or it's unintentional. And the third way that it operates is through boasting. If you boast about things it is believed that in in many cultures you boast about things too much you talk too much about your good luck your good fortune your good plans you know the raise the job the car you talk about all these things all these upgrades in your life and you make yourself a target for the eye you essentially tempt fate when that happens and that was also a huge thing growing up it was you know and I, and I talk about this in the book a lot you know silence don't don't talk about this don't talk about that stay quiet you know, we we celebrated positive things, but, you know, certainly you're not going to go and talk about it so much. Even the new toy, you know, if you were a kid, be careful about, un, you know, unveiling that new toy with your friends outside. You know, do it little by little so that, you know, 15 kids don't recognize the expensive new toy because it'll, it'll you know, get the eye on it. So it's a malefic force. It can be intentional. It can be unintentional. Or you can bring it upon yourself. And the reason why I think it's just so pertinent, and it always has been, is is because it ties into human emotion. You know, and that's that's what we have all experienced envy, feelings of envy ourselves. So we've all experienced feelings of jealousy ourselves, even if people don't like to talk about it or admit it. But I think we've also all been on the receiving end of someone's jealous glance or a jealous comment or, you know, snarky comment and so we know what it feels like from both sides and that's what the eye is about and that's why it is so much alive in the world 
today still, you know, and that it's so old, but that's why it's alive today. Mm -hmm. And you have an interesting definition in your book where you talk about it as an, a, a sort of a, I'm going to quote you here, a, a withering force of sterility. And I know that, you know, historically it's, it has been linked to things like impotence, but I think sterility there, you kind of expand beyond that. And you also talk about sort of sterility of someone's garden or the sterility of someone's good fortunes, right? So is, is that an accurate kind of summation? Oh yeah, of course it is. What happens is that the force itself can be seen as being able to, you know, it dries things up. Mm -hmm. You know, it it makes stagnant. It it creates blockages. So, and what happens? You know, you, you get a blockage or something stops running properly and it does wither. You know, that happens, you know, to plants. It happens to parts of the human body. It happens to just about anything. And that's what the force can do. People often think it's about... Um, themselves, people have said to me many times, you know, oh, I, you know, I got sick or I have a headache or this, you know, physical ailment got me. But it's not only about that. The the eye absolutely has its power over objects and and areas over your life that you might not think it does. And and that's why I I do go over that very much in the book about it being a force that has that kind of power and that kind of impact and and it will absolutely wither things away it'll break things down mm -hmm. it's a sort of a corrosive force too yeah and your point your point about like the the toy i think is so good i can picture you know the, the child taking out the the brand new fire truck and the eye hitting that it's not going to literally cause the thing to wither and obviously it's a toy so it's like it can't be sterile but you know, it stops working the way it's supposed to, right? It sort of blocks up the functionality of it. So I really like your definition. I think that's a really good definition, honestly. So um, it'll block it. It'll, and you'll also find yourself, interestingly, and this happened as a kid many times. And my <laughs> grandfather would say, you see, that's what happens. Somebody, you know, put Malocchio on, on, on the toy and you drop it and it yeah. would break. Yeah. You know, and that was another thing. It did not, you were careful it so carefully and then suddenly you dropped it and boom, there it was. Yeah, all of a sudden you know. the gravity gets so much worse wherever you are. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really and in that that relates to see and in that example, in that example, what was really withering or breaking down in that example was not so much the toy itself; it was your ability to to watch over it and to protect mm -hmm. it. You know, your your sense of protecting it that's what withered away, and so that's yeah. why you dropped it. That's what that's where the eyes sort of was operating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a really that's a great breakdown of that. I love that analysis of it. That, that's fantastic. This this is not something that has only appeared with toy fire trucks. Of course, this is something as you said, it goes back a long way. <laughs> and and I've read, you know, for example, I think there's a case book done by a folklorist named Alan Dundas, and I've kind of looked through his material and some other material as well. But this goes back. This goes back really even almost before recorded history. So I'm kind of curious, you know. What do you see as kind of the roots of this and, you know, how has it evolved over time? Well, we know it goes back at least as, you know, as far back as the, you know, as ancient Egypt. I mean, it, symbols, eye symbols, like the eye of Horus, you know, you can mm -hmm. see that that was painted on boats and coffins. Yes, to avoid, you know, jealousy and, and negative or, or envious glances on, on toward boats that were crossing. but on the tombs of pharaohs that it led them through the afterlife safely. So we know it goes back that far. Many scholars believe it can go back to Mesopotamia. I, I believe it goes at least that far back because we're talking about something that is actually as much a facet of the human condition as it is something quote unquote supernatural. Okay. It is, mm -hmm born from envy, which again, we, we all know these emotions. No one is immune to these emotions. If you're human, you have felt these emotions or you have been on the receiving end of these emotions. So that's where the eye is born. Or it's born from that sense of, as, as I go back to you know, the boasting, whether that's intentional on your part or not, you know, you could be proud of yourself. You could be proud of your kid. You could be proud of your spouse. You could be proud and you're just talking about it. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is something that can tempt the eye. And I think that that as well, just wanting to to celebrate, you know, something that too 
is very much a facet of the human condition. And every one of those things, whether it's envy, whether it's resentment, whether it's anger, whether it's talking, you know, or, or quote unquote boasting, all of those things, we all share those, you know, characteristics. So that's why I think it goes really, really that far back. And that's why it has never died out. It stays with us and it has remained with us. And that's why it's so prevalent today. It's never gone away because it is really a facet of the human condition. Mm. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I, and I think you're right. I think it's it's something where we're identifying both sides of the human condition, the sense of like where we tend to want to be proud of things, but we also tend to be jealous of other people's successes. And so the eyes kind of exists in that space where we negotiate that. And, you know, it's because it goes back so far, I think this makes sense, but, you know, you've written a whole book about the evil eye. And I know, you know, one of the things that we see kind of in the the book market today is people will kind of write books. that are supposed to be spells for every occasion, spells for, you know, all, all your needs met. Right. Um, or, you know, maybe spells that are like, here's a bunch of love spells. But you've really focused it down. You've talked about the I specifically. I'm kind of curious, you know, what led you to decide to write this book specifically? Well, of course, as I mentioned earlier, this is something that I grew up with. And it's something that I've, that's always, always just been with me, I feel like, since day one. So I've had that obsession with it my whole life. But I wrote the book because I... I really do believe as a practitioner and, you know, for many years, I've, you know, I, I've, I've done readings, I do readings, and I've had people come to me and say, this is what's going on in my life. And, and I can't, it's, it's just this huge stream of bad luck that's entered my life. You know, not only did the relationship end, but I lost my job. Then last week, you know, I got two flat tires last month, you know, this whole big thing. And I've had I've had people talk about that so much. I've had even now that the book is, you know, just about to come out. I mean, I, I get many, many emails now. It's it's become a daily thing from people who I don't know who are emailing me. And I and I appreciate all of them and I do my best to catch up with them every single day. And I, I often succeed, but not always it's getting much. But I I really think that I felt a need to make people aware of the evil eye. I would often speak about it to people and say, you know, there's this thing called the evil eye. Many people know about it or has, oh, I've heard about that. You know, my, my grandmother, my grandfather, or my neighbor talked about that, or they've seen the Nazar, you know, the, the, the most mm-hmm. popular amulet at this point in the blue and white concentric circles and, or that they've seen a Hamsa or they've seen the Italian, you know, the, the Cornicello, the red or the horns. And they'll say, I guess that's what it's kind of about. But they don't know the the depth of it. And I often found myself educating people about it and saying, look, I can I can tell you if you have the evil eye, I can do a ritual and, and tell you if you have the it's very simple. And then I can tell you what to do to sort of get that, that, that negative energy off of you, away from you, and to keep it away. Practices that you can incorporate into your life, small, easy practices, practical practices that you can do every single day for yourself, for your family. So I wanted to write a book that focused on it because it's such it's it's fascinating. It's such a specific subject, and yet it's so broad and so wide ranging because it has such a rich and varied history, and because it really does go across religions and ethnicity continents and creeds and everything you can find it in so many places and so many people so many cultures will come and say yes i know what that is it's called this and i mentioned that in the book that when i got to high school and i you know left this very small world of of a private catholic school that i went to where there were i believe 23 kids and you know at graduation Mm -hmm in eighth grade. And then I went to this very big high school in Manhattan, you know, that I went to LaGuardia High School, the fame school, Mm -hmm. and it was a wonderful place. And I was very fortunate to go there. And suddenly, I got there. And I thought, all these things about Malokia and the evil eye, I thought I was, you know, well, no one's going to know why I'm making horns under the table, because somebody said something or why I'm wearing what I'm wearing. But I started to meet kids my own age who were of different ethnicities and they all had different names for the same thing. And that's a really powerful moment when I think back on it, because I thought, oh, wow, this is really not just about one 
religion or one culture or one area or something. And that stayed with me forever. And even now, I wrote the book because I want people to understand and be aware of the eye. And I want them to know that there is this force that exists. It's energy. And again, it's alive in all of us. It's not the kind of curse that most people think of the word, you know, you think of curses. People say, do I have a curse on me? And they have these images of, you know, somebody, you know, lighting, you know, 15 black candles and getting mm -hmm. graveyard dirt and, and bone and hair and wrapping it up. That, you know, that's certainly true to some extent for some practitioners, but there's another form, another kind of a curse, and it's much quieter. And that's the subtitle, you know, that there you mm -hmm. have a quiet curse. Mm -hmm. It's much quieter. And it's dangerous, if not more dangerous, because you don't know. You can't really see it necessarily unless you catch someone giving you that look. I've caught people giving me the look. I think people have caught me giving them the look, <laughs> um, to be honest. With you. And it again, it happens to all of us. And I wrote the book because I wanted people and I want people, I should say, to be aware of the evil eye as a very real force, as energy. It doesn't matter really what you believe in or what you don't. You've experienced it or you will experience it. And I want people to know how to identify it and how to cure themselves and, or, or, you know, cleanse their environments, their, their own lives, their own bodies, their own minds, their own homes, your car, your career, your office. It, the eye exists across all of the above. And I want people to be aware of it. And I want them to know how to protect themselves. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I think you're you're dead on about the sort of you know, it's everywhere all at once. But at the same time, like you said, it's not necessary. It's, it's so quiet, right? People don't know either. Sometimes don't know that they're doing it or sometimes don't know that they're receiving it. And so you do kind of have to it's sort of a constantly vigilant sort of state. And one of the things that I think was really interesting in, in your book is you mentioned the home in there and the idea that it's not just about, you know, wearing a charm around your neck to keep it off of you, but you might actually have space in your home. It might be a really good idea because I think when people think like home altars, they're thinking like, oh, it's dedicated to a specific saint or God or, you know, sort of divine figure. But you kind of have this, it's almost like, almost like having an altar for protection from the evil eye within your home. And I was curious if you could kind of talk about that and kind of, you know, why, why you think that's so important. I think People can have, and, and certainly do have, now an altar for the for the evil eye. Yes, you can have a simple altar if you want and actually have an altar the way many of us magical practitioners mm -hmm. do. But what I, when I talk about it in the eye, in the book about the evil eye, what I often instruct people to do is, because not everyone's comfortable having an altar. You mm -hmm. know, not everyone, you know, is going to be able to hide an altar or, because listen, let you know, the, the facts are the facts. Whether you're a magical practitioner or not, whatever you believe in, you're going to face people closest to you are not going to like it or going to think, why do you have that in your house? What are you doing? Why is that there? What do you mean? What is that? You don't necessarily want to deal with that. And I have amulets and things that are hidden from you. And believe me, they're altars, but they're not altars in the sense that they have, you know, 15 different statues or, but they're very simple. And one of the things I instruct people to do in the book, if they want to, is to make a, what I call the table Nazar. Mm -hmm. And it's basically taking something like either if you have a blue plate and if you don't, you can take a, a, a plate and, and color it blue, whether with paint or more, it's very simple and practical, but you can, you can do a ring of salt. And, you know, a clove of garlic, a peppercorn, and you actually have a nazar right there. You can put that plate somewhere. You can put it behind the counter where no one sees it. You could put it on a table where no one sees it. You can put it under a table or on a chair that no one's going to see it. And you have the force of an altar right there because you're creating an amulet right there. You're creating energy that is deflecting the eye or that is going to little by little cleanse it. And you can see also when you do something like that. Afterward, you can look at it and say, well, what, you know, what's happened to that clove of garlic? It looks cracked. It looks strange. It looks different than when I put it down. And you see, you can see, you can see that it has absorbed the negative energy. And so it kind of took the hit, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways to incorporate it into your life. For some people, 
saints and you know if you're catholic saints are you know all over the place but also if you're not catholic saints are are all over the place too angels all over the place because we identify very much with these beings and these spirits who will either intercede or act on our behalf and people have small figurines you know i've instructed people who've said to me look i, I i'm not comfortable you know I, going back into the whole catholic or christian thing i, I just don't want to start doing that and I, okay but have you ever heard of a prayer to the archangel michael mm-hmm. you know and oh yeah yeah, yeah I, I know that I mean, many people with tattoos or i see the image of him the sword the light you know I, you can have a small statue of the archangel you can have an image of the archangel michael you know somewhere mm-hmm. on your desk you can have that small nazar you can have the small hamsa even out of sight the horn i even you know there are uses for you know i in the book i talk about the power of a rose you know with a thorn on it you know a thorn Mm -hmm. will obliterate the eye so that in itself there are ways that you're going to have quote unquote altars that maybe you don't maybe you want it to be noticed and you're you know you that's my altar that's what i do and here it is or maybe you want it to be something more private and you can do that as well and that's the power of of having you know amulets that work with you not only when you're wearing them but if you're going to build an altar if you're going to put something in your home you can place it strategically so that it's hidden you can place it right at the front door where people see it you walk into my apartment you know right away what's going on you know you know there's opposite. also you know there's there's also my my husband is jewish there's a mezuzah on the door mm-hmm. there's also a ham so when you walk in you know, there's a lot of stuff going on but that's who we are that's who i am that's who he is that's who we are but a lot of people don't necessarily want to be you know open and out you want to hide it or not hide it so much because you're ashamed but you just want to keep it private because maybe you feel like that's how the energy is going to work best for you you can do that and that's you know and that instruction is there in the book and i really i'm glad you brought that up because it's so important in the home it's so important mm-hmm. Well, I love that. I love that you mentioned it. I think it's it's so it's so great that you kind of incorporate that in there because I I do think it's very easy to get caught up in all of the amulets and things like that. But I love your point about like no, this is something that kind of it's not just about wearing a nice piece of jewelry. It's also about you kind of setting your space aside so that it can it can also like you said take the hit or or absorb some of this negativity without without hit, hitting you. So I think that's great. I grew up also my people don't think about it sometimes, but I grew up, my grandfather used to always say the port, you know, the doorways in your homes, the doorway mm-hmm. to the bedroom, the doorway to the bathroom, the doorway anywhere that's in itself is a portal. And mm-hmm. if you don't have an outlet and you just want to utter a prayer in those, that doorway, that was something very big growing up that was done, especially to a room, a child's room, a bedroom, the doorways, you could stand in the doorways and, and, you know, literally, create energy that is going to deflect them with the right prayers with the right energy so it, you know we can go on and on about that but i just wanted to mention it because oh, i think sure. it's important for people to absolutely. know absolutely yeah no and it and it really is and there are so many ways to kind of bring that bring that into your home and i love that you get into that i do think we also have yeah. to say that the amulets are part of the fun there are so many wonderful amulets oh. one of the ones i mean i'm always wearing red thread that's the thing i'm always always mm-hmm. doing which i love that you mentioned that's my on right now yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great way to do it. You mentioned some that I, like one that I hadn't heard of. I did not know that St. John of Arc could be deployed against the evil eye. I think that's wonderful. But I'm curious, you know, what were some of your favorites mm-hmm. to sort of discover in this process of doing the book? Ones that you encountered that you really liked, or maybe even some that you thought were like, oh, that's maybe a little more unusual. And I haven't, and I haven't seen as much of that one. So the amulets. Yes, we could get the amulets is such a huge thing. And I love I'm a big bling person. And if you saw mm-hmm. me right now, I mean, I have, I don't know, probably 10 chains around my neck amulets. I have my wrists or, you know, I, everyone always jokes that we can hear Antonio coming because I jingle and jangle wherever I am. It's like, you can hear me coming because mm-hmm. everything clinks together. But the amulets are very important and i often and in the book i do discuss as well the difference between an amulet and a talisman and amulets first of all joan of arc the reason why i chose joan of arc and you don't have to be catholic or christian certainly to to know about joan of arc an incredible story and also you know a a story of courage and a story a sad story too but i write about her briefly in the book and explain why she is is because 
she's a force. And when you need courage and you need to go up against something that you feel is overpoweringly negative or just overpowering itself, Joan of Arc is she will absolutely grant you courage. And I've been in that position myself. So I have invoked her. So that's for, for me, she is one of the saints that can absolutely do that. And again, when I talk about the saints in the book, you no, know, you don't have to be Catholic or Christian. The saints are really so, I think they touch all of us because don't forget, they were human. And so they had a human existence and they understood everything that we're going through. They, they went through everything, you know, that we go through, you know, today as humans. So as for some of the amulets, I mean, growing up, I wore all the time, you know, the, the amulets that are pretty common to see, the, the cornicello, the red horn, when a lot of people say it's, a, you know, the red pepper, you know, why mm -hmm. is it a red pepper? It, it's not, it's actually a horn. And then the hand, the mano cornuta. And in the book, it says mano, it says it's the O, so cornuta, and it looks, it's printed masculine. It's, it's actually, it should, it's cornuta, but in different parts of Italy, they will say mano cornuto as well. So mm -hmm. that's the horns. I researched a lot of these amulets and I loved learning about, in some cases, just how far, you know, they, they went back. The fact that eye symbolism itself is so powerful, even if it's not necessarily related all the time to the lie. The fact that in antiquity and history, we see that they, our ancestors understood the power of the eye as a symbol. They also, the Hamsa is, is for me, you know, a favorite and a fascinating amulet because the hand, you know, it's the hand and it represents so much, not only the hand of God, but then the hand of Fatima, the hand of Miriam, the hand of Tanit, the Hamsa has all of these associations to it. And again, runs across so many faiths and so many cultures. And what is it? You know, you look at the hand. We hold up our hands to defend ourselves. We hold up our hands to stop things. We also use our hands to brush things away, you know, to deflect something in order to push it away. And so researching these amulets, I saw just how powerful and how how deeply ingrained in, in humanity and in our sense of what it is to be protected, just how far the amulets go and, and how strong they, the current runs very, very deeply. And it's that's why it too, the, the whole amulet, the wearing of the practice of wearing an amulet or amulets, in my case, certainly plural, it, it goes far back, but it again, it has never gone away. Because we know inside, we know that there's a power to it. There's a reason for it. And you can feel that, you know, you don't have to. And I always tell people, it's okay. A lot of people don't like to admit it. They don't want to talk about it. That's fine. But I think the amulets are so important because you know that when you take an amulet and you're putting it on, you're doing that for a reason. You're doing that. Why? You should ask yourself if you're listening. Why? Why are you putting on the am? Whatever it is, it's because you feel some sort of visceral connection to it. You know that there's an energy that connects you to the amulet, the amulet to you, and there's a belief you have. Whether it makes you, and it, you know, it can make you just feel safe and comfortable. It can be a personal memento, but the amulet has the power to sort of stir a kind of energy and in the sense of an amulet, it is a protective energy. So that was the experience of researching it. And I, I wish I could have gone on about amulets. One of the stories that I loved, even growing up Catholic, I was not so much aware the story of Benedict, you know, St. Benedict has, the Medal of St. Benedict is fascinating, um, which I write about, and and sort of the symbol of also the symbol of the raven. And it just also the animal and the scarab for Egyptians, the different the different spirits and gods and goddesses, you know, for obstacles, you know, all of these amulets, the Om symbol, they all have their power. And it's vast, but it's still it all goes back to that one point that we wear them and we use them because we know viscerally that there's a power and, and it they work. 
and we feel that and that's why that's why they're they're so so popular because we know what they do we know their magic mm, yeah yeah and i i think you make a really interesting point there with people putting on ambulance you, I mean, you make a lot of really interesting points there but one of the things that, that i thought was really interesting was your point about think about why you're putting it on ask that question of you know what what is it that i i want out of this amulet and that kind of brings up to something really interesting. So I was watching something the other day and one of those sort of target mini ads came on and I noticed one of the things they were selling were these little Hamsahan talismans as a, just sort of a piece of jewelry. And I'm kind of curious, you know, how do you how do you feel about sort of the, the merchandising of some of these amulets or the way the eyes appearing kind of broadly, you know, even as sort of like a fashion accessory in modern times? Is it something that like, you're concerned with or is it something where you're like well it's kind of how it how it is like you can buy jewelry on the street in turkey and it's going to have the nazar in it like you kind of how do you what, how do you make sense of that in modern times i think it goes back to the it goes back to the feeling back to the to the reality of of being human of feeling the emotions that are attached to the hamsa the nazar the the horns it all goes back to a sense of wanting to feel protected, wanting to feel like you have some agency over what's going on in your life. So much of what we go through is out of our control. It's out of our hands. We feel like, you know, the, you know, the world is pretty crazy. You know, we can look around ourselves and, and we can see things, we can feel things that just make us want to turn away and close our eyes and say, oh my God, I... I not going to go out that door ever again. You know, I think the need for the, the reason why these amulets are so much everywhere, you can see them everywhere now. You're right. You see them in Target. You could see them on shoes. Like briefly, I write about this in the book as well in the fashion industry. You know, there was the shoe line years ago that I think Stuart Weitzman did. And there were t shirts and backsplashes and in every, it, it just goes across everywhere certain and, and in the fashion industry dresses and gowns and handkerchiefs i think it all goes back to wanting to be protected and also knowing that you can take steps to protect yourself you can walk into target you can walk into your local occult shop just the same now and you can find the nazar and you can find the Hamsa, you can find whichever amulet you want, and you're going to use it, and you're going to feel that sense of, I took action to protect myself. I took action to protect my home, my family, my job, whatever it is that you think needs protection or that needs some sort of cleansing or that needs, or, or you need to create a barrier against some sort of negative force. The amulets give you that feeling you've taken a step you've taken action so i i rather like that you can go to the stores you know and find them because years ago it wasn't always as easy you know certainly if you went to europe you know growing up when i would go to italy it was always as a kid it was always easy to find the horns and you know the mano per nuke and the cornicello and and all the stuff related to malocchio that was you know easy in certain small towns and certainly in, in same thing in Greece and Turkey, you can see the Nazar, you can see that, you know, all of, not all of them, but certain amulets, the Hamsa too, you can go and find all over parts of the Middle East. But it used to be that you had to hear if you wanted to find a specific amulet, you know, I know growing up when I wanted to find a specific amulet or see something specific, I had to find an occult shop, you know, and that sometimes that meant taking the train into Manhattan when I was growing up in the Bronx or I meant finding one of the local, you know, there were only a handful of occult shops in the Bronx growing up that maybe would have them. And there was no Amazon when I was growing up, you know, there wasn't, there was, you know, no internet. So it wasn't easy. But now I think going out there and saying, oh, yeah, I think I need a Hamsa even if it's for your wall, I think I need an azar, even if it's for the bedroom, for the door, whatever it is, being able to get it easily. I, I think it's a very good thing because I feel like it gives people, it fulfills the need for protection and it gives them that sense of just, I did this or I'm going to do it. And 
I've taken a step toward my own protection. Mm. Right, that aspect of control, like you're talking about, and and responding to uncertain circumstances. I love that. It's such a good observation. But you did say you said you were into bling. I'm kind of curious. Do you have any any you know anti eye charms that like are kind of your your high fashion jewelry that you wear? Like are the ones that you wear that are you know as much or more decorative than they are functional? It's such a good question because I'm so I have so much. You know, I wear. The Ankh, I love the Ankh for me mm-hmm. is a symbol of protection, but it's also history. It's also a symbol of, you know, rejuvenation and, and new life and health. And, you know, so it's, it's an amulet of protection, but it's also a talisman that, you know, attracts positive. I think, let's see, I'm trying to look at, yeah, you can probably hear they're, they're clinking everywhere next. <laughs> I know, give me kind of a homework assignment um, here. I'm I, sorry. <laughs> You know, but listen, going to Catholic school, I'm good at homework because I got everything done. <laughs> you have to get it done. So I still, you, you, the homework, you, you get done, believe me. When you, I always say that I had, when, when people say that about, you know, deadlines or getting homework done, I said, you know, well, growing up, I had, you know, Sister Mary deadline on one sh- shoulder and Sister Mary, you know, you better get it done on the other one. So you yeah, got right. it done. <laughs> and that, that was the experience. One of the, the pieces that I particularly love that I'm wearing right now is it's an amulet of the Archangel Michael. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, it is just an equilateral cross. And I love this one in particular because I really think, like so many people, when we think of the Archangel Michael, we really, we do feel immediately that sense of protection and that that sense of divine guidance, you know, that that hand sort of coming in, or in his case, you know, the sword that's going to cut away something negative and, and really move in and protect you. That's probably the one that I feel a, a pretty deep attachment to but i can't say you know it's like trying to choose for me it's like trying to choose the favorite kid i couldn't choose one in particular <laughs> i also have one i love the the ben porat yosef that i have from israel here that that my husband got me which you know has such history too I, the amulets it can tell a story i tell you and even when i wear even my right now it's like i look at the pentacle that i wear as well The amulets tell so many stories going back. And one day I'm going to, I'll I'll post a picture and I'll, or or, or I'll send you a picture. (laughs) You can see my neck and you can choose what you think would be the, or the the best sort of amulet here. It's hard to choose just one, but, and it's not something that stops, by the way. I, I, it's, I keep collecting them and people joke and are like, you know, one day you're not going to be able to lift your head up because you have so much (laughs) weight around your neck. I love that. That's wonderful. Okay, well, let's talk just a little bit about intentionality as well, because you also talk about the jittatore in here, the people who basically, they, they are casting the eye, but they are not trying to cast the eye. And the thing is, you know, this isn't a situation where they're necessarily blamed and persecuted for this. It's just sort of accepted that they exist and they that you have to sort of find ways to navigate around that. So, I mean, how do how do we do that? How do we navigate the idea that somebody could accidentally cast a curse on us, but not like not want to treat that person poorly or differently in in those circumstances? From exactly what and you said it from from being aware of what many people don't know that they'll come across it in in the book. The jetatore is or jetaturas in some cases because usually growing up it was usually referred to as a man mm-hmm. who kind of had this power it was they just very very sad characters because they brought about bad luck and bad stuff just by glancing at them and i've known people who have felt that they have this and they're very very you know they end up they don't want to hold the baby they don't want to get in the car they don't want to do this so in italian culture it was a big thing growing up that that person could have been because bad stuff always happens when they're around mm. but how to protect ourselves against this exactly from what you from from being aware of it that sometimes this is what happens and when you're aware that that possibility that energy exists 
you bring yourself to a place of how do I protect myself from this? That goes to back to either the practice of choosing an amulet or choosing a particular, if you're not comfortable with an amulet, there are ways I mentioned somewhere in the book, if you think you're going to be up against negative energy, maybe you don't want to wear an amulet. It's not your thing. That's fine. I, I've had not honestly, not very many times have I had an instance where I've had to leave without my amulets because they're so like a part of me, but I've carried bay leaves on me. Mm. And if I think I'm going out somewhere and I don't necessarily maybe have my amulets or I could have run out and I forgot them or I left them, you know, here and I, I'm running here, two bay leaves, three bay leaves, you put them in your pocket, you know, you think you're going to have negative energy against you or you feel it. You, you, And I talk about the symptoms of this in the book about the evil eye. I, you know, I just went out, I was with someone or I went to a meeting, I went to a party, but I kind of came back, I feel my head hurts, I feel this, I started you know, I fell twice on my way to the car. I lost my keys. All these things start happening. You don't necessarily have to have the amulet. If you're holding something as simple as, you know, you have two bay leaves in your pocket, three bay, you have a sprig of rosemary in your pocket. You can use that. You take that with you. That's the beauty of, of these practices. That's the beauty of the folk magic practices. They're very simple, very practical. And we know that there's power and magic in everything. Every little thing counts. You become aware of it. And you take the steps to just say, you know what, if I go up against someone, I I have either the amulet on me or I have, you know, I got my bay leaf on me. I have the sprig of rue on me. I have something in particular that I know is going to protect me. Or I also, I give examples in the book of certain prayers. There are certain prayers you can write out. There are certain incantations you can write out. And ultimately you'll get to, you know, they're not, difficult or or you know hard to learn you can ultimately memorize them and by reciting them to yourself you do deflect negative energy when you're in that position and you know a certain incantation or a certain prayer and you're reciting it before you go in somewhere or after you know you come out and you say you know what i feel ugh, that was bad energy i can feel it a prayer an incantation will do it an amulet will do it carrying a certain herb will do it so there are many many ways and that goes back to also your question about writing the book. Many, many ways to protect yourself. But it starts with the awareness. Mm. It starts with being aware of it. And there, you get to understand the trajectory of, of protection. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can then sort of have those interactions with people who, again, it's not like they're not deserving of human interactions because this is a thing that they do. But you, you're you're protected. They're able to interact with you, and it works fine. I am curious, though. One thing you talk about, kind of towards the end, talk about the idea of you can actually use the eye intentionally. And I'm sort of curious: Have you ever done that, or you know, what are what are the sort of risks that someone has to consider before they do use the eye intentionally? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, in the book, I do write about. There's a, a chapter about how to cast the evil eye, and the reason. I included that in the book, and I think I start that chapter, and I say, well, uh, you, you got through a whole book about evil eye, and protect yourself against this and that, and then I'm here I am, and it seems counterintuitive, but in fact, it's not. I, it's a force, and it's energy. The point of learning how to cast the evil eye from my own perspective and my own practice is that it is a form of defense. And sometimes, and I give examples in the book, sometimes you know you are the victim or the target of someone's ill will. Sometimes you know it. I have been in that position. I think most people have. It doesn't, it's sometimes, sadly, it could be someone you see every day. Sometimes it's a family member. Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's, you know, a neighbor, a coworker. There are instances where you know that person does not wish you well. That person does not want you to succeed, doesn't want to see the smile on your face, doesn't want to see you get the promotion or whatever it is, doesn't want to see you prosper or or just be happy. It, it becomes as simple as that. Sometimes you know it because people will make you aware of their resentment in some cases. People will make you aware of their jealousy. They'll make you aware that, you know, I don't think you deserve that. You know, what did you do to get that? 
You know, why do you have it? And I don't, you know, why I did just as much work as you did. Why is it you, you know, and they get angry and they get resentful. Sometimes in those situations, you know it. And it, in my opinion, and I talk about this in the book, it works in, in your favor to learn how to use the energy to cast the eye on someone so that they basically know not to keep looking at you with mm. the same bad energy and bad thoughts, with the same contempt, with the same anger, with the same job. They know after you look at them in the way that I describe in the book. And it is about, it's not just looking. There is a system to it. You do learn how to raise certain energy. You learn how to, draw, you know, the there's a shield you know we all those of us who are practitioners we know the importance of protection shields and learning how to keep our environments you know our wards up and things like that and i talk about that i think it's important because learning how to cast the evil eye for some if you feel comfortable doing it and it's something you have to think about and i again i talk about this in the book if you're comfortable with it you can learn how to do it and it's not something that you ever want to do callously you don't just want to go around you know the street or go around your, your neighborhood or whatever it is just giving people mm -hmm. evil eye it's something you it's it's a process you have to discern but it's in my opinion it's a form of protection and it's a form of self-defense and yes i have used it and yes i do i think i write in the book not i think i know i write in the book about this aspect when people talk about quote unquote cursing and you know the laws and and three and karma and this and that that i believe very much that when you're casting the evil eye on someone who wishes you ill i think you are restoring balance you're bringing balance back it's it is to me unnatural to just turn the other cheek and to ignore someone's ill intentions i don't think that's wise at all i think we have to take action sometimes it's and, and i have spells and prayers in the book that you know can get the, you know, the evil lie out but with regard to learning how to cast it yes there are people who've asked me this a lot and some are uncomfortable with it many are not so uncomfortable with it they're very intrigued by it i think it's important if you're comfortable with it to learn how to use that energy and it all goes back to yourself you have to sit with yourself and ask yourself what am i comfortable with you know and and these are conversations that you have with yourself you have to be comfortable with doing something mm -hmm. or it's just not going to work and that that goes up of course across the board with things you have to be mm -hmm. comfortable doing things but when it comes to ma when it comes to any form of magic you have to be comfortable with sitting there and knowing that you're taking this step and you're working with very real energy it's not something to be taken lightly don't just think you're going to say oh well now i know how to cast the evil eye so you know this person who's been annoying me that's your you know like like with anything else if you use if you, you know if you abuse something or you use it callously or you're gonna see ramifications not in the form in my opinion necessarily of some sort of karmic backlash but just your own energy sort of gets depleted in a way mm -hmm. and that's why it's something that you have to discern and you have to know there's a time and a place for it there are situations for it and yes in those situations where you feel threatened or you feel like this is a danger or you know this is getting a little bit uncomfortable and again i think everyone can feel that energy that's when i talk about also that the quote unquote the sense of being stared at mm. everyone i has felt i give examples i talk about you know you're standing around and you don't know why suddenly you turn around and you find someone you know across the way is staring at you mm -hmm. you know what's that about that's energy you feel them staring at you or flip the side of the coin how, you know look again how many of us have been either you go to a party you go to a restaurant maybe you're just in a room and you see 
your crush or you see your ex or you see the friend you had a fight with or you see someone who, you know, maybe that, and you start to stare because you want to get, you know, you want to see what's going on, but you're doing mm-hmm. it sort of secretly and you're hiding behind something. And then all of a sudden, you, know, you think you're doing a good job of it. And then all of a sudden that person turns around and catches you, mm-hmm. you know, and you're like, oh, Jeff, how did that happen? I don't want that to happen. It's because they felt that energy, this, again, the sense of being stared at, which is a very real energy. That comes into play when you're talking about learning how to cast the evil eye. What is it that makes you feel uncomfortable? And what steps are you going to take? That's what it comes down to. Learning how to cast the evil eye, it's a personal decision and it's a personal practice. I, I put it in the book because I think it's wise to know how to work with that kind of energy. Mm -hmm. Because we're all going to face these situations. And that's why I think it's important to know about them. Mm -hmm. Right. No, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt anybody to understand how, how somebody could intentionally do it either. I think that's a really good point because, you know, one, you may need to deploy it, but two, it's also good to understand the mechanism because that can make you better defending it too. So very, very good. It's a great book. Really, really excellent book. I'm curious, are you going to be, tackling any other magical topics in the near future either are you going to be maybe writing more about the eye or other magic i know you're doing some work for the wild hunt as well but you know what's kind of the future for you well, i've been writing yeah. Thank, i've been writing i i write for the wild hunt i've been writing pretty regularly for a couple of years and i love the wild hunt and i love the fact that i'm able to write about the community book wise Yes, I am working now. I I cannot yet go into specific detail about the Mm -hmm. next book, but what I can tell you, let's see, what can I tell you? Let me think. (laughs) I think I can tell you that it is, it, it redefines a very old aspect of magical practice. Mm -hmm. It redefines it for our world today for what you know we would call put up with the modern world in a very in in a very unexpected and very useful and very practical way but it, it looks at something like again just very old and and something that everyone you know is very much aware of and probably that many people already do but it, it redefines it and it broadens it for who we, where we are today in the world mm, um, like and that. you know like when they get a chance to, to when I when there's when I can speak about it more, I can promise you, Corey, you're you're getting a call. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic! I, I'll be excited about that. It's, you've made it so mysterious now that I'm very very excited to to, to see so, kind of what yeah. develops. So, uh, but that's good. You're like you said. Sometimes soon. you gotta gotta be silent so that it's not gonna run into something like the evil eye. Right? Let's maintain the silence for just a little, right? little longer, I guess. So you see and. You have to think, yeah, this is how I, I think in those terms. But I, but you brought that up, I just want to say, and I always tell people that doesn't mean that, you know, being aware of and, and believing in the evil eye and practicing what I call evil eye magic does not mean that you go around in that constant state of suspicion mm-hmm. and a constant state of who's giving me the eye, who's jealous, who's resentful, who's angry. When you get to learn when you learn about it, when you understand it, it's actually the opposite. If you understand how to identify it, and so it becomes very, very liberating mm-hmm. because you'll understand what to identify, what to look for, what you're feeling, and you'll you'll understand that it's the truth that not not everybody always wishes you well, but you'll learn how to work with that energy and and deflect it and it will absolutely free you up from a lot of thoughts about what's going on here what you you know you stop wondering and you start knowing Mm. and that's a really freeing thing for me that's what you know that's what it's meant for me all these years and that's what i really wanted to impart i love that that's beautiful and i I agree i think that is a very freeing place to be when you the the knowledge the knowledge sets you free in, in in some ways so Antonio Pagliarulo, thank you so much for being with us. I really enjoyed having this chat with you about the evil eye. Can't wait to chat with you about future projects now, too. And we're going to put links to your websites in our show notes so people can find you as well. But yes, thank you so much for joining us here today on New World Witchery. 
Thank you, Corey. It has been such a pleasure. And, you know, I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you so, so much. Oil and water, lemons and pins, horns, hands, fists, thorns, and the eye itself. So many encounters with it over the past 5,000 years. Ancient, yet contemporary. A living piece of our collective human history, one that taps us into our own story. Because at its heart, the evil eye is just a part of what makes us human. Envy and jealousy, disappointment and fear. But also hope, strength, and the will to take action, even against unseen forces. So it goes with the eye, and with us. Our thanks go out to Antonio Pagliarulo for sharing his knowledge with us on this topic. We'll have links to his book and other contact information in our show notes. If you'd like to share your thoughts on this or any other episode, you can write to us at our email addresses, compassandkey at gmail.com and newworldwitcherypodcast at gmail.com. If you want to find us around the internet, you can visit us at our website, www.newworldwitchery.com slash find hyphen us to track down our social media, upcoming in-person appearance, in-person appearances, such as Mystic South, and more. Plus, you can visit that website, newworldwitchery.com, and find over 200 articles on folk magic and still growing. We also appreciate the generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you'd like to become a patron, please stop by patreon.com slash newworldwitchery in order to share a dollar a month or whatever you can and get some great perks like access to our Discord server, book clubs, extra episodes, and more. Thanks again to Antonio Pegliarulo and to all of you out there for listening to us. We hope that you have a wonderful day with or without a pocket full of bay leaves and a an Nazar. And we'll be back again soon. Thanks for listening. Be well. New World Witchery is a production of New World Witchery Podcasts and is released under a Creative Commons Share and Share Alike license. The title and closing music for this episode is Woman Blues by Paul Afgirnos, licensed from AudioSocket. Socket.